So if the, if the speech starts to drag, I am happy to give you some. I'll start with a good Halloween one. Skeleton walks into a bar, asks for a beer, and a mop. It's not bad, it's not bad. Three guys walk into a bar. You think one of them would have seen it? All right. <laughs> It's great to be here with all of you today. Thanks so much for inviting me to spend a little bit of time with you during this conference. So let's deal first of all with the elephant in the room. I am the definition of a city boy. I spent my life working on cities and on urban issues and I do not claim that my years growing up in Red Deer County and going to River Glen School, a school with its own rodeo, true, I did not participate in any of the events. The only thing I was qualified for was the grease pig race, and I thought that was undignified for me and the pig. But I don't claim that any of that makes me an expert on rural issues. I do know a little bit, though, about being a local elected official. And I've been spending a lot of time uh, over this last month, um, or last month, I should say last six months, traveling every corner of the province, spending more time with people living in communities of every size, in the big cities, in mid-sized cities, in small towns, and in rural areas, talking about the work that needs to be done, talking about where people are at in building this great province. And I want to take a minute right now to recognize an extraordinary builder of this province, and I want to take a minute to recognize Paul McLaughlin. So Paul and I, let's hear it for Paul. Oops, I got to work with Paul uh, a lot uh, when I was mayor of Calgary and particularly through the COVID pandemic. I always found him to be an exceptionally useful thought partner, helping me understand, getting out of my mindset and understand what was really going on around the whole country. I think he regrets giving me his cell phone number because I'm still harassing him all the time. Um, but I appreciated that wisdom then. I appreciate that wisdom now. I know you will continue to appreciate his wisdom going forward. So one more time, let's hear it for Paul. People like Paul, people like yourselves, go above and beyond to recognize what needs to be done, to step up to do the change. And I know as elect local elected officials, you probably all have a similar story to the story that brought me here today. Let me tell you, I was enjoying my retirement. It was good. I was making some money, often sleeping until noon, uh, pretending I was a senior a little early. But at some point, I looked around at what was going on with this province that I love so much, that you all love so much. And I said to myself, you know, somebody's got to do something. Let's go find somebody. And too often, that somebody ends up being yourself. And I know every one of you has had a somebody's got to do something moment in your political lives. And thank you for being somebody. Thank you for stepping up and doing that work. And I understand that the passion for that work continues. I just uh, was talking about the election that's happening this afternoon, and I hear that there are at least uh, 147 people running for president, which means Paul must have done a terrific job, and good luck to all of the five people who actually are running. Now, I want to get a little more serious for a moment. The party that I now lead, I know, has not always been seen as showing up for rural Alberta. And I think in many ways, we haven't shown up in the ways that we need to show up. We have not understood what we need to understand about everything. And there's some truth to that. But as people keep reminding me, I'm running for premier of the whole province. Now that has mostly manifested itself in the fact that I had to get a Connor McDavid jersey. It was hard, very hard. And I'm pretty happy, uh, I'm not happy because it's the first time in CFL history, but I guess in one way I'm happy I don't have to choose between the Stamps and the Elks this postseason. As if I would ever have to choose the Elks, just saying. Um, whole province, whole province, they keep telling me that. But I have been traveling a lot, and I have been talking to people in every corner of the province, and I'm joined in that with a bunch of my terrific caucus colleagues, all of whom have been given the assignment to get out of their ridings and to see more folks. And I'm joined by a large number of my NDP caucus colleagues today. Maybe I can ask them to please stand so you can see who they are. And they're all happy to spend some time chatting with you going forward. 
In particular, I want to highlight, uh, keep standing, uh, I want to highlight our Shadow Minister of Municipal Affairs, Kyle Kosowski, uh, who is here talking with municipalities of every possible size, and particularly our Shadow Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation, Heather Sweet, who has taken on a special role for me uh, as our lead on rural economic development and rural economies as well. And I know many of you know Heather because she has never seen a small town rodeo that she does not want to go to. So, um, I did ask Paul McLaughlin for some advice on this speech today. And one of the things he suggested to me is that I ask you some questions. So I'm gonna ask you all some questions, even though I think I know the answers. How many of you have to drive more than an hour for a medical appointment? How many have to go more than two hours? Okay. How many of you have currently at home access to affordable, reliable broadband? Okay. How many of you have your local hospital or health clinic that has had to reduce hours or close ERs because of staff shortages? Wow. Okay. How many of you are worried about the quality of education or even the future of your local school? Okay. How many, this is an easy one, how many are worried about the cost of living and the cost of doing business? There's like five people who didn't put their hand up there. I want to know more about you. How many have had challenges in your communities with increases in crime? How many are super happy with the government's uh, approach to rural crime? Okay. Didn't you get an announcement today that you're gonna have to pay slightly less horrible money for less service? Sorry. <laughs> How many of you have you lost your local victim support unit? Okay, and how many of you are facing budget challenges due to the government of Alberta reducing the amount it pays in grants in place of taxes and or in oil and gas companies not paying their taxes? Okay, so I could go on and on and on, but I would suggest to you that these are all very serious concerns and that these are all very serious concerns that are affecting Albertans in communities of every size but in different ways. I've talked to a lot of folks in this room. You've been very direct, I really appreciate it. Your priorities have been very, very clear. So I do not know a lot about, as much as I want to, about rural Alberta, but I do know a lot about being a local elected official. And I will tell you that what we always need is collaboration with the government of Alberta. We need true partnership with the government of Alberta. We need a government that treats us with respect and works with us. And while I was mayor, believe it or not, I had six different premiers. And I actually lost count of the number of ministers of municipal affairs. I think it was 12 or 13. And we had to work with all of these folks in ways to ensure that we're building our own communities. And like all of you, I was used to governments of every stripe premiers of every stripe, ministers of every stripe, treating municipalities with, at best, benign neglect. But I've never seen a government quite like this. A government that really has gone from treating us with neglect to in some cases treating us with outright contempt. And I wanna give you some examples of things that I've been very surprised about. Instead of focusing on the priorities that are important to our communities or the majority of Albertans, things like increasing access to health care, improving quality of education, ensuring that there are good, decent jobs and real economic development in every part of this province, investing in the economy, making life more affordable. The government of Alberta seems to be focused on consolidating its own power by controlling local elections, by botching funding negotiations with the federal government, by making emergency response worse, downloading more and more financial burden onto municipalities. I really want to thank RMA for the recent work in trying to quantify the infrastructure needs in rural Alberta, over $17 billion in roads, bridges, and water infrastructure that are not being paid for. And I just want to say, spend one minute, I think we probably all, now that the election down south is over, would prefer never to speak about it again. 
But I want to say one thing about what the election yesterday means for Alberta. It means that we're going to have to work doubly hard to ensure that we're crafting and creating and supporting and protecting market access for all of our goods. The president-elect has said that he wants to tariff everything everywhere. He does not believe in free trade. I strongly believe that Alberta oil and gas exports will probably get an exemption from his tariff plans, but agricultural products will not. And so we need a provincial government and a federal government working together, and I criticize both of them for not being able to do that well, being able to work together in a Team Canada approach to ensure that we have market access for all of our goods and services. The economic repercussions of not doing that are dire. But I'm sorry to say that we have a federal government, no surprise, because we're used to it, that punches down on Alberta. We also have a provincial government that would rather fight than win. They would rather pick more fights than actually make deals. And to me, this is a huge challenge. I look at the example of Peter Lougheed. Nobody fought more fiercely for Alberta than Peter Lougheed. But he also brought home deals. And this government seems to be missing that second part, sitting at the table, negotiating, figuring things out, and bringing home deals for Albertans. But guess what? The government thinks there's no problem. Recently, we've heard ministers say the government is doing a great job consulting municipalities on legislation. They refuse to release, for example, the results of their actual consultation on Bill 20, which we know was unanimously condemning Bill 20. But they're doing a great job on consulting municipalities. Yet they blindside rural municipalities over and over again with legislation that actively hurts your communities. And I hope you feel heard. I was in the legislature this week. This has been a very interesting couple weeks for me because I've been in the legislature, something I've never done before. I thought I knew what politics look like from city council. Oh, the ledge is something completely different. But I've been taking good notes. And so in the ledge this week, when one of my colleagues raised the issue of the huge hole in local budgets, Minister McIver dodged it. And all he said was, well, you're saying we're not paying our taxes. I don't do a very good Rick McIver. You say we're not paying our taxes, but governments don't pay taxes to other governments, so we don't know what you're talking about. That was his answer on grants in place of taxes. He didn't acknowledge the problem. He didn't say what they were going to do to try and fix it. Even worse, in a follow-up, Minister Jean, the Minister of Energy, said, and I think I need to quote this, the vast majority of oil and gas companies pay their taxes. The number of companies that are not paying their taxes is very small and insignificant. He went, oh, there's more. He went on to say he had encouraged rural municipalities to write him a letter if there were oil companies not paying their taxes so he could fix it for them. And not one municipality wrote him a letter, so clearly there is no problem. How do you all feel about that? Is there no problem? in your local budgets when we have Paul McLaughlin telling us that one-third of rural municipalities are facing financial ruin right now. We deserve a government that respects what's really going on here. So I'd like to encourage you to take Minister Jean up on him, write him a letter. But also, please copy me. It's nenshi at albertandp.ca, pretty easy to remember. But beyond encouraging you to write him a letter, you know what? You shouldn't have to grovel for support. You shouldn't have to beg for help from your government. You should have a government that treats you fairly and with respect. So very briefly, I want to talk about what a better approach might look like. And I'm just going to whip through a bunch of things because we are actually working on all of these things right now, and I want your input on all of them. But they include fixing the issue of government not paying its own share of taxes, making it more expensive for municipalities to operate and host elections. A uh, uh, mayor of a town in northern Alberta told me that the election getting rid of the tabulators will cost his, uh, his town $100,000, which is three points on the property tax. Considering and reviewing land use planning to protect important agricultural land while ensuring true property rights for landowners. Better rules to protect land rights and the people who invest 
better regulation so utilities, commissions, and regulators are not overruling decisions, developing a wildlands task force, a better approach to firefighting and emergency response, continuing work around natural disasters, and of course, real work on rural economic development, supporting agriculture and agribusiness, including value added and access to export markets, including increasing tourism, as well as including agritourism, and better access to affordable broadband. And of course, the most important thing is, you know, I fought for that legislative government fiscal framework when I was mayor. I said, given an accelerator that is focused on government revenues, we'll take the downs with you if we can take the ups with you. What I didn't expect them to do was set the LGFF at 2008 levels for us to handle 2024 costs. And I'm well aware that the LGFF doesn't solve the problem on roads, bridges, and infrastructure. When you've got 3,000 kilometers of roads in Vulcan County and 4,200 people, the LGFF isn't gonna fix that. We need sustainable financing that understands that that infrastructure is not just for the good of the people that live in the community, but for the good of all Albertans. So I'll wrap up just by saying this. Politics over the last decade or so has conditioned every one of us to think this is as good as it's gonna get. It can't get better than now, only storm clouds are on the horizon. And that encourages all of us to take a mindset of defending everything we've got. Because if we don't do that, then things will be worse off. But I've never believed that. It's not why I got into politics. It's not why I believe somebody's got to do something. My parents chose this place. I always say I chose Alberta, but I was only 18 months old, and my mom says the briefing book was not very well written. It was mostly in crayon. But I chose this place twice. Once my family chose it when I was very young, and once I chose to come back to Alberta just before I turned 30. And I didn't choose it because I thought that I needed to defend every crumb we've got. I chose it because Albertans are entrepreneurial, because we're innovative, because we will always demand better from our governments and from ourselves, because we will build better, because we are strong, because we are resilient, because we look after one another.